A very good morning to you. Welcome to the Breakfast Club. My name is Bright Mube. So this year marks 40 years since the inception of Kukra, when 20,000 people were killed in Matavaland and some parts of Midlands. This show is kindly brought to you by SITE in conjunction with National Transitional Justice Work Working Group in Zimbabwe. Welcome to the show, guys. Today we have spoken to Kosi Moyambofu, Reverend Motsi, and Babu Mube. Welcome you. to the show. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. Start with you, Rev, on the issue of the role of the church in solving conflict. What's the role of church in post-conflict and reconstruction in Zimbabwe? The role of the church is supposed to be instrument through which people can be reconciled within communities because they are well placed in communities where they are meant to be able to assist uh, families, uh, communities, uh, particularly if you have had major uh, crises and major traumas like Gukurahundu. It is really unfortunate that the church was conspicuous by its absence during the time of Kukuraundi and even after. So the role is to bring peace, to bring transformation, to help comfort uh, those that are victims and try and offer assistance of how best they can be re rehabilitated. So that's basically uh, what the church can do. And from a spiritual point of view, uh, the most important question that everybody wants to answer is, where is God when people suffer? I think that's the most critical question. And the truth about that is that God suffers with us. God does not leave because there's a problem. We tend to listen to our pain, to our experiences, and God feels and seems very far away. <clears throat> but God is very near. That's what the church needs to bring to suffering people, the presence and the comfort uh, of God during the time of need. Uh -huh. Allow me to bring Baba Ngobe <coughs> into the conversation around the issue of transitional justice in Zimbabwe. 40 years later, since Kukurawanda happened, but there isn't a reconciliation. Also, take on that, commemorating this, uh, 40 years later, there's not been trans uh, uh, maybe reconciliation and healing. Well, I think the most important reason is the fact that uh, we have not had a transition. We are talking about transitional justice without a transition. The people who killed, who committed the, the violations that are uh, the subject of the conversation today are still in power. We will be the first country ever on earth to successfully do a credible transitional exercise or program without a transition. So the major reason why we have not moved an inch on uh, addressing the Kukra on the genocide is because the people that committed the genocide are still in power. So they are pulling all stops, making the point that nothing moves because it will incriminate them. The truth will incriminate them. Justice will incriminate them. So they will do everything to make sure that nothing moves. And that's the reason why nothing has moved so far. When you wrote about influence of women in terms of sexual abuse during Kukra Wound, what's the effect of Kukra Wound? What was the effect of Kukra on women? Okay. Um, let me take off from where Effie left off when he was talking about transitional justice or the lack thereof of transitional justice. One thing that I believe is that when it comes to sexual violence, it has it is a blind spot of transitional justice, any transitional justice efforts in Zimbabwe. Women traditionally, historically, have always been relegated to the sidelines. The suffering of women, be it rape and any kind of sexual violence that they go through has always been seen as an acceptable part. Women are collateral damage when it comes to, to conflict. And Kukurahundi is no exception. When you listen to narratives, the grand narrative of Kukurahundi, we talk extensively about the thousands of people. You say 20,000 people were killed during Kukurahundi. We have thousands of people who were disappeared. Homes were torched to the ground. Property was looted. Livestock. But women are seen as being not as important. They are kind of boys being boys. Mm -hmm. So it is expected that women are going to be raped. And so as a result, we need not focus on the suffering of women. These other crimes are graver, they are more important, and they warrant attention, national attention, international attention. But historically, women are always relegated to the sidelines. And even within Kukrahundi, I was talking to Effie the other day, and he was telling me how... Um, in one of these hearings, a woman was asked what she expected. A woman who is a rape victim was asked how she could be compensated. And um, her response was that maybe they could build a rod. And 
this is not an individual uh, kind of reparation. It's, it's communal. It's for everybody. And my thoughts to that way, this woman has been so relegated all this time that she doesn't. She did not think that anyone would ever ask her what could be done to help her. She has never really sat down and thought, if they do this for me, the yeah. person, the individual, then it could help me. And I've always believed that when it comes to sexual violence, um, the woman might be the victim. But within the Kukurahundi context, it is the men themselves who own that anger. It is their wives. So they own that anger. Women have to be silent to protect these men who have been shamed mm -hmm. by the sexual violation of their women. Women are property. It's kind of like a man whose cow is stabbed by, by naughty boys. When people commiserate with him, it's about the men and his livestock, which was what? Destroyed. It's not about the cow. So woman becomes this property. Right. So her suffering is not about her. It is about this man whose wife, whose daughter was violated. And so we're thinking about how can we compensate this man? How can we make mm -hmm. him feel better? And we forget that there is a primary victim here who is the woman who needs to be addressed, whose pain needs first and foremost to be acknowledged before it can even be redressed. So I believe that as long as we're at a stage where women are not seen as equal victims to the men, uh, and I suppose the sad part is uh, that when it comes to women, they suffered the same atrocities as men. They were killed. It was their homes which were torched. Mind you, many men were in the cities many men were in South Africa when that happened. So it was the women who faced the bulk of the suffering. And then they go on to, to suffer sexual violence. So they, 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 they are suffering it uh, sort of, it's kind of like a double proportion of what happened to the men. And then they also have to suffer um, sexual violence. So I think as long as we do not acknowledge that women are as important victims when it comes to ground, then we have a long way to go before we can say we've effectively addressed gender uh, during this conflict. When it speaks about torching of houses, uh, people disappearing, some people being bent alive, some people being killed. But there are many implications of this. Let's bring about the church now, spirituality implications of this violence on people. What are those implications that have spiritual implications of this violence on people? The, the spiritual implications are, are major. First and foremost, every human being is created in the image of God. So whoever then attacks that individual, is attacking the image of God, first and foremost. Secondly, from a spiritual perspective, uh, life is sacrosanct. Life is holy. Life must be respected. There is no one human being who has the right to take another person's uh, life. That, that is fundamental from a spiritual perspective. So for a government, a person, a military wing, to decide they are going to wipe out a certain section of the national, of the community, is just not right. And I think this is something that, in my opinion, must be condemned uh, and used the strongest word that should be found to be able to condemn such kind of action, because it also reflects on how God hates murder. Uh, or rape, uh, and therefore it is that kind of understanding from a spiritual. What that basically means is that you are, you are destroying the fabric of the community. And once you destroy the fabric of the community, you are making sure that the development uh, of this community is not going to be what it should. And as a result, it means m communities in Matibeland, because of the disappearance, because of the killing, because of the violence, uh, have been scattered and others ran away to the point that these communities up to now, 40 years after, have not developed. Why? Because we are who we are because of others. Now, if you kill, and you cause us to destroy, I mean, you, cause, you destroy other people. This, to me, is probably the aim of Gukura Hundi. Because if it is true politically that somebody wanted to destroy the basis, the foundation uh, of Zapu uh, through the Ndebele people and whatever hatred somebody had against them, uh, means that they wanted to make sure that nothing would actually come out of uh, Matibele What else would somebody 
want to wipe men, women, and children, unborn babies. What was the aim? So to me, um, the, the, the heinous part of this is when you consider the, how evil somebody was, and this is evil, this is violent, that for five years, somebody was getting regular reports of how many people were killed, and he kept on saying, go on, until five years, from 1982 to 1987. Now, even from a biblical or spiritual perspective, uh, that there, there couldn't have been anybody who was that callous to allow such things to happen. You know, in Matabel Land or in Midlands, Baba Ngobe, whenever we see soldiers or when we see helicopters, we get this trauma because of the effects of Kukra, do you think do you think our government has done enough? What is what has our government done perhaps to deal with these effects of Kukra on, on citizens? Well, uh, it is important also to to start by emphasizing the fact that uh, the fact that we have not had transitional justice. The four key pillars of transitional justice have not been realized in Zimbabwe, and what you are asking will fall under one of the pillars or intersect between the pillars. Uh, the first thing that we do not have first and foremost is the truth. We do not know so much about what happened during Kukurawundi. And that truth is the right of individuals as well as society, the generality of the people of Zimbabwe. They have a right to know what transpired during Kukurawundi, the circumstances uh, under which people were forcibly disappeared, were killed, were raped, were tortured, and uh, who was participating, the roles that were played by various units, individuals, and so forth, and the identity of the victims. Uh, beyond what uh, you, we, we are talking about, uh, the actual numbers of babies that were killed, the actual numbers of women that were raped, the actual numbers and so forth and, and so forth. If you, so you start with the truth. There hasn't been any movement towards the realization of the right to the truth. The second a pillar of transitional justice is the right to reparations. A society has not been repaired. There was uh, so much damage on the economy of material and on the social fabric and so many other things. Uh, people over a decade could not develop, could not go to school properly, and all those things remain unaddressed. Uh, and so without reparations, you, you have not done anything at individual level, at societal level, to repair the damage that was done by Kukura one day. The third pillar that is critical is justice. You need to do justice. In, in all its forms, whether it is retributive, it's restorative, and all those uh, things, you need to do justice. And this is important because it, it emphasizes the, the rule of law, something that is a key pillar of any democratic society, any law-abiding society. Uh, the addressing Kukura Wundi is a, is a fundamental point in, in the democratization processes that we we are driving as a, as a people as Zimbabweans. If we do not address Kukura Wundi, the, the impunity, the absence of the rule of law, the, the absence of democratic out, accountability will remain a, a stain in the country. It will hold us back. Unless we show, we demonstrate through uh, institutions of, of justice, that we cannot tolerate the kind of uh, massacres, the kind of violations that took place under Kukura Wundi, then the country will always be moving from crisis to crisis, massacre to massacre, uh, uh, rigged election to rigged election and so forth, because the rule of law is absent. The last and very important pillar of transitional justice is guarantees of non returns then here you are talking about value system reforms, institutional reforms, constitutional reforms, legal reforms, uh, security sector reforms, media reforms, all sorts of reforms in order to, to undo the institutional damage, the institutional fragility and weaknesses uh, in Zimbabwe that are allowing the kind of violations to continue. Remember, it is the military that perpetrated the, the violations uh, uh, or during Kukura Wundi, the military is in power today or has a measure of control 
the violations that you are seeing is because we have not addressed the Kukura wound. So government has not done anything whether it comes to addressing the psychosocial aspects, trauma counseling, nothing has been done. And I don't expect government to do that because this government is composed of perpetrators of Kukura wound. So they cannot themselves come back and say, we are going to provide you with psychosocial counseling, uh, with trauma counseling because they don't want to admit first and foremost uh, the scale of the damage that was done so we are yet to get to a stage where the government the perpetrators acknowledge uh, the the commission of the atrocities that they, they perpetrated against the people so to the extent that they are not acknowledging they are not willing to move an inch in terms of addressing that so we need a whole of society approach a commitment from border to border from district to district to say we are going to resolve, we are going to address, because now you cannot resolve the issue of Kukura when many people have already passed on. We are now addressing the legacies, the impact of it on communities, on education, on our way of life, but most importantly on our social and governance fabric. What we are seeing today, the misgovernance, is a result of having perpetrators of a genocide remaining in power. We need to address those things. If, if Ngobe speaks about the issue of um, there hasn't been transnational justice 40 years later after when Kukuraund happened, how do you feel about that to see women who were raped during Kukuraund, they've never been assisted by the government? How do you feel about that? Um, maybe let me say first of all, the unfortunate part is that as long as the, the grand picture, the issue of Kukuraund itself is not addressed at a national level, it is not possible then to say that we're going to, to talk about sexual violence away from the killings and everything else that obtained during that time. So the first step that needs to be taken is to address Kukurahond. It is unfortunate that even now with the mechanisms that we have, the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission, for example, Kukurahondi has not been given sole priority. Remember um, when it was when it was uh, established into law in 2018, one of the priorities of its five-year plan was Kukurahondi. But now we're coming to the end of the 10-year mandate of the National Peace and Reconciliation Commission, and absolutely nothing has been done to address Kukurahondi. And as long as so there is silence, there is secret around Kukurahund, the grand picture, it is not possible to talk about sexual violence because it is part of what happened during Kukurahundi. It is part of the weapon that was used by the 5th Brigade to attack the Ndebele community um, on a massive scale. So I want to believe that the first step is to address Kukurahundi, the bigger picture, and then zero in on issues to do, to do with women because women suffered on a massive scale. Mm -hmm. Right now, we know that in other countries, in Rwanda, in Bosnia, in, in Herzegovina, in, in Sierra Leone, we know the approximate, the approximate numbers of women who were sexually violated, women who were raped. But when it comes to Zimbabwe, we have no idea how many women were, were sexually assaulted during Kukurahundi. We just hear narratives of women were raped, women were raped, this happened to women, they were sexually violated. But there hasn't been any concerted effort to interrogate, to look deeper and see how many women were sexually violated. Because then how do you come up with interventions if you have no idea of the scale at which uh, women were sexually violated? So first and foremost, we need to look into that. We need more research into how women suffered. Um, what are their needs? For example, when it comes to psychosocial support, as long as we are not talking about sexual violence during Kukurahundi, how do we expect these women who have been silenced, institutional silencing, patriarchal silencing, how do we expect them to seek social, uh, psychosocial support? How do we expect them to even understand that what happened to them is it's grievous, that they really deserve, just like everybody else, to be addressed, to have something specific to women, to have platforms. I know that we're having hearings here in the particular around the chief's initiatives, but what may Measures have been put in place to ensure that women get a, a, a kind of specialized attention, that they're able to, to speak about their experiences and feel that they're being addressed. Because for women to stand up in a public setting and say, I was raped, there's stigma, there's fear of, 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 of people laughing at you, there's, I mean, there is a lot, of, there are a lot of variables at play when it comes to someone publicly speaking about it. If you have a husband, you want to protect your marriage. If you speak out publicly and say that I was raped, what happens to your marriage? So the bigger picture is being ignored. So I think there needs to be platforms specifically made for women, be it um, other women talking to them in private spaces so that they know that they are safe, that they know that this shame that has been brought about by what happened to them and also the shame that what happened to them brings to their families and to their communities, that it is something that can be discussed in a private setting. 
my experience has been that a lot of women haven't received any form of psychosocial support. In the course of my week, I realized that the few women who have had some kind of support, particularly from civic uh, organizations that include Ugutula Trust, that include um, Christian Alliance and other organizations, they have moved a little bit from victimcy. They, they no longer see themselves as victims. But there are women who have never in any way been addressed. And when you talk to them, you can see that they are still victims. They are not, they are not survivors. They are still being defined by what happened to them. They are not able to move away from this idea of them being victims of, of sexual violence to them being active citizens because they still live within that fear, within that shame. And as long as that is not addressed, how do you expect them to step away from victimhood and, and position themselves as survivors who, despite what happened to them, can be functional citizens contrib contributing to development initiatives in their communities. So I feel that there really is need for women to be addressed as an entity, as a people who suffered a grave uh, uh, atrocity in much the same manner as um, everything else that obtained during Kukurahonde. Right, if you're just joining us, this is The Breakfast Club. My name is Bright Wengov, and today on the show, I have the three guests uh, talking about each of Kukurahonde. 40 years later, there hasn't been justice, there's been reconciliation. My guest is Wongo Simoyombof, a reverend Amod Zede, and F. Ngobede. This show is brought to you by National Transitional Justice Working Group, a platform established by 36 Zimbabweans and transitional justice stakeholders to provide the interface between transitional justice stakeholders and the official transitional justice process in Zimbabwe. Let me go back to you, Rev, on the issue of peace building and peacemaking in Zimbabwe. Earlier on, I spoke of yeah, about the church being silent during Cook Ground. What's the role of church now in peacemaking and peace building in the context of Cook Ground? I think the bottom line about the role of the church is that uh, the Bible is replete, it's full of um, examples of how the church, uh, first and foremost, says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. So we are meant to be peacemakers. Secondly, uh, we read in, in the Bible that uh, for God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the whole world to himself. Therefore, he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Uh, that's the role. And therefore, the church should have been taking leadership. What is lacking in our country at the moment is leadership, particularly from uh, men of the cloth, uh, women of the cloth, whatever the case may be. Uh, people who are able to articulate uh, the role of the church to bring about peace, to talk about justice, to make sure that there's social uh, uh, harmony uh, and there's reconciliation uh, within the communities. These are the roles uh, of the church. That's basically the bottom line. When we don't have these things, we are not going to move. Anyway, now to start with, uh, we need to be able to identify what is wrong. What is basically wrong in Zimbabwe is that the church should have been in a position to actually stand up and be able to say what government of Zimbabwe did using people's tax to kill other sectors of the community was wrong. And therefore, from a spiritual perspective, there ought to be an acknowledgement of wrong being done. That's why you hear even Effie uh, and Mrs. Mpoff here finding it difficult to move forward because there has not been any acknowledgement of a wrongdoing. Now, there is need for acknowledgement we believe that acknowledgement leads to repentance and forgiveness. When people then sit, after acknowledgement, people then sit and they acknowledge what happened. You hear others, how they've been hurt uh, as human beings, and you talk to each other. Uh, it's a process. It's not an event. Uh, and therefore, that event has not yet even started. And this is what the church should bring about. It is our role to bring people together so that they can reconcile, so that they can talk about their differences, so that we can assist them in making sure that something like this happen. Um, we, we, we find that the problem is that the majority of pastors are buying their silence, I mean by their buying their time 
and space by being silent, not wanting to talk about the issues that is affecting the church. As a result, you'll find that for more than 40 years, ch Christians, church members, have been coming to church with their burdens. They will drop them off at the door, go into a church, do praise, speak their t in tongues, and sing their worship songs, and they come out, pick up their burdens, and go back home with. Because the church is not addressing the issues. And I personally believe this is where the problem is. We must call a spade a spade, like already been mentioned. Truth is a tenant of, of, of Christianity. Faith is a tenant of Christianity. Faithfulness is a tenant of Christianity. Now, these are missing links in dealing with Gokurahun in Zimbabwe. We don't want to talk about the truth. We don't want, uh, we don't give people hope. Uh, and there's no, there's no faith. Uh, the church is not giving hope uh, to anybody about what's going on and the things that really matter uh, amongst the people. I believe these are the bigger problems. Reconciliation is the biggest need within our country. And that's the ministry of the church. Uh, Reb spoke about the issue of acknowledgement. Four years later, there's not been an acknowledgement from the government of the day. But however, 2017, you saw President Namsam Nangal come and say, I have set up an NPRC to deal with Kukurawund. Do you think there will ever be true healing and truth telling in the Christian Zimbabwe? Well, there won't be any truth telling and no healing as a result because, uh, as I said earlier, you have a situation where not only is Kukura Wunde a, a genocide that is unacknowledged by the perpetrators, but the biggest problem is that as things stand now, the government that you are talking about is not a government, it's a group of perpetrators. That's what they are. In, in relation to Kukura Wunde, they may be government when it comes to other things, but when it comes to Kukura Wunde, they are perpetrators. They are the ones who bear the greatest responsibility for what happened. They ordered it, they planted it, they, they ate it and they abated it in many ways. They participated in, commit, in committing it uh, through the institutions that they had. As superiors and as commanders, those that are leading this country are responsible for what happened during Kukura World. Besides talking about the junior people that were doing the actual killing, raping and so forth and so forth on the ground. So there is no healing that can take place when the perpetrator is still in charge, calling the short. And whatever you, we are talking about, these are perpetrator-driven processes. Um, uh, you go back to 2009 to 2013 when the conversation around the, the, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission was being debated. As civil society, for instance, from the late 1990s, we, we pushed for a Truth and Justice Commission. And uh, the constitution that they came up with, uh, uh, what we called the Kariba draft in 2006-07, had no such a thing. Uh, the 2013 constitution, I, I remember then when the, the discussions were taking place, the, the last item to be agreed on uh, that faced the, the greatest resistance was the NPRC. Uh, the, the government of the day then uh, Zanu PF representatives in the conversation in COPAC did not want anything to do with Kukura Wundi, anything that will, will address Kukura Wundi. So they were dragged into accepting the NPRC and they killed it by not operationalizing it in 2013. First and foremost, it was given a sunset clause to say only for 10 years, 2013 to 2023. Thereafter, they did not operationalize it with a, a, a law until 2013 uh, when they, they passed the NPRC Act, which then operationalized it. And then guess what? They killed it through lack of money, through bureaucratic uh, constraints and many other things. So the NPRC at the end of the day did not do anything. Then the next thing is we are still looking uh, towards the NPRC, flawed as it is, to do something about Kukura Wundi. The president, who I must insist and mention, was there during Kukura Wundi and not being a spectator. He was Minister of National Security 
in charge of the Central Intelligence Organization, which is a key perpetrator organization at the time. He sat in the cabinet. He sat in all the structures uh, that were responsible for perpetrating Kukura Wonde. At some point, he was chairperson of the <coughs> High Command uh, after 1980, uh, which was responsible for the integration of the three armies, but which also at the time led the persecution of the people who were seen as dissenting voices. So there is not going to be any healing, and as a result, there is not going to be any reconciliation without a credible transitional justice process. And a credible transitional justice process is one that is not led by the perpetrators. It is an independent process, an impartial process, that he hears from the victims as well as the perpetrators. You look at the chief's process, for, for instance, the chiefs are being asked to go to the community. We are not told where the, the perpetrators are going to go, but they are the ones who have the truth about what happened. So if we are looking for the truth, we need to bring perpetrators on board in terms of putting them in, in front of uh, a, a truth commission to say why and how they perpetrated the offenses, and also to shed light on the circumstances and certain facts that are needed in order to have a, a broader and complete understanding of what transpired. So for now, there is nothing on the table that one can say is going to bring the whole truth for the people, uh, for the victims and the survivors, and the people of Zimbabwe in general. So based on that, there isn't going to be any healing. So what we need to do is to, is to come up with a very credible process based on international best practices, because we are not the first people to do, to conduct a transitional justice exercise. As I said, the challenge is that there is no transition, and therefore there isn't going to be any justice because there isn't a, a transition. There isn't going to be any healing because there is no attempt to achieve that healing on the part of government. But in closing, uh, well, let me bring it back to the conversation of too quiet uh, on the issue of recommendations now. Mm -hmm. What can you recommend to the government of the day on how to deal with the issues of uh, women being raped on the ground? What can the government do? What are some of the recommendations can impose? Um, I think first and foremost, as with the case with Kukraundi itself, we have to talk about the acknowledgement yeah. that women are victims of Kukurahundi in the same scale as people who were killed, people who had disappeared, homes with, which were touched. Because the idea of women suffering being relegated to, to, to the, 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 the pillaging of livestock, chickens, goats, I think it's, it's belittling the suffering of women because they suffered on a massive scale. So the first thing that should happen is the acknowledgement. And then rather than lumping the suffering of women with everything else that happened, there has to be a tailor-made uh, transitional justice mechanism to address what happened to women. And more importantly, women have to be part of that conversation because you find that oftentimes when it comes to tra transitional justice efforts, it is the men who are at the center of, 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 of planning transitional justice mechanisms. The women themselves, because they know what happened to them, they know what they need. At least they can be in a conversation where they, instead of getting prescriptions on how they should heal, they should be told that you need psychosocial support, you need this. It should be them who are front and center of discussions around what happens to them. When it comes to transitional justice, as if you will agree with me, the victim should be at the center. There should not be a prescriptive kind of transitional justice, this kind of top-down, which I think is happening in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. People are being told they should mourn this way. They can exhume, they cannot exhume that. They are told how to grieve. They are told how to, to address the issues that they are going through. So women need to be front and center of discussions around how the, the issue of sexual violence, the issue of the sexual violation and rape of women should be addressed. So when that happens, at least then it is the women themselves who are leading the process. And as long as they are leading the process, I think we will be better able to help them, be it um, access to, to psychosocial support. For many women, there is need for medical uh, attention because many women were, were, were physically injured, they were fistulas. Uh, there are a lot of women with, uh, with, who, who conceived because of these rapes. And there are all these children. What has happened to these children? We do not have any way of knowing how many of these children were born, how this has impacted on the women themselves, how the, this has impacted on their relationships. Because in other countries, you will find that uh, there is evidence that men who have witnessed the, 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 the rape or the sexual assault of their women become aggressive 
post-conflict. So the women suffer during the conflict, and then when they go home post-conflict, they continue to suffer because the men are not able to handle what happens because they were not able to, pre to protect their women. They then vent out that anger to the very same victims. So I think there is need to address that to see how communities can be helped to cope with this shame. Because as I said earlier, it is the woman herself who is, who is uh, violated, but it is the family, it is the community which also suffers uh, uh, that shame that she went through. So there is need also to address that communal relationship because sexual violence, it, it destroys the community fabric, fabric and researchers have shown that to, to, to knit that fabric back together after sexual violence is very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. So we need a communal intervention as well. How do individuals heal? How does the family heal? And how does the community as a whole heal? Um, because as research, as research has shown, sexual violence targets the entire community. We want to destroy this community. So by, 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 by forced pregnancy, we are destroying the women's ability to conceive for their own communities, but to bear instead enemy children. We are taking away um, their agency because now they live in fear. The very threat of rape itself means that women are afraid to go out and participate in the labor force. They, are, they, they cannot go and, and fetch firewood, fetch water, cook cook for their communities. And as long as that fear remains, even you'll find that some women still suffer through that 40 years later. So as long as that is not addressed, how do we expect these women then to become active citizens in their communities? So I think that placing women front and center, ensuring that there are platforms specifically designed for women <clears throat> to express their feelings, what they need to make demands of their communities and to try and heal, um, will be able to, to address the issue of women. Allow me to close the show with uh, Rev. Rev, your remarks on the issue of conflict resolution. Forty years later, there hasn't been uh, acknowledgement, as Effie puts it. Where can, can, where can you see a Zimbabwe going forward without any acknowledgement in terms of solving the conflict? I don't think we'll go. I don't think we'll go anywhere uh, at all. I personally believe that the church, uh, as an institution, has got a very, very critical role to play. Uh, unfortunately, because of fear, because of harassment, uh, because of the threats that the church uh, has had in the past the church has not recognized its position within the society. I would like to leave this with everybody, that when God started to, to build the world, he built worship, uh, not, the, not the state. Worship comes first. Now, where there is no worship, proper worship of God, there is chaos, there is violence. And as long as the church has not recognized its role within the community to bring, to bring about advice, to bring about awareness, to bring about issues of justice and peace and reconciliation. We are meant to be the conscience of the nation, to allow as prophetic and come before the world and say truthfully, that says the Lord, what is wrong is wrong, what is right is right, without fear without uh, trepidation. I, I, unless the church is able to do that, then the church uh, ha, ha, has no role to play because we become uh, of some earthly use and of no heavenly purpose at all here on earth. Hmm. Bongi, Arif, uh, Mr. Ngulu, thank you so much for your time this morning. Thank you very much. Thank right, you. there we have it. This has been the Breakfast Club. My name is Brighton Ngulu. Today we're discussing the issue of Kokura Wundi. Forty years later, no healing, no reconciliation, no truth being told. This show has been brought to you in partnership with National Transitional Justice Working Group, NTJWG. My name is Brighton Ngulu. Please do enjoy the show and the rest of your day.